Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of sorts. So I picked up a couple of new releases, and the first of those is Mike Cole's The Killing Light. This is the third volume in the Sacred Throne series, which is a very entertaining... I guess you could say it's a low fantasy, military fantasy hybrid in that kind of pseudo-medieval setting. The main character is, goes from basically teenage girl to warrior slash leader. Although one of the kind of flaws that I would have with this is that she's a bit too much of an authentic teenage girl. She's sometimes a little annoying in a way that is, I think, authentic to teenagers, but not necessarily enjoyable in terms of reading. However, as with the rest of this series, the battle scenes are really well done. Mike Cole writes uh, quite a bit of urban military fantasy, uh, and he also writes nonfiction about ancient military formations and stuff. He has a very entertaining social media presence. Uh, he describes it as him trying to experiment in branching out into a different style. I don't know that pseudo-medieval military fantasy is so different from contemporary urban military fantasy, but this is a fun series. The main issue that I have with this is that I don't see why this was published as three separate books. This one, it took me a while to get back into the characters, and I felt like if I had read the other two immediately before that, I wouldn't have felt the same way. And unlike a much longer series, because sometimes you do get these massive fantasy trilogies where each volume is 800 pages, and they have to be published separately just because the books would be too ridiculously heavy to carry around. But with this, this is this is 230 pages. The second one I think was 250. The first one was around 200. These could easily have been published as a single volume, and I think it would read better as a single volume. So I kind of cynically feel like this should not have been published as a trilogy, because I don't feel like the story flowed, especially the first one in this, where there was so much exposition at the beginning of it that even though I enjoyed the final quarter of that book quite a lot, the pacing felt off. Whereas if that had just been the first bit of this full, you know, 600 something page novel instead of the first of three, I think that would have been more successful. Still, if you enjoy military fantasy in a pseudo medieval setting, I do thoroughly recommend this. I will note that despite the fact that I'm talking about the main character being a teenager, this is not a YA novel with any kind of uplifting moral to it. This is very cynical in terms of the world religion. A lot of people die, a lot of people are tortured. So if that is the kind of story you're looking for, that's not what this is. I would say the universe is slightly closer to grimdark, but I would not call this grimdark. It's not quite as grim uh, for the sake of being grim as that genre would call for, but um, it is closer to that than it is to an actual book aimed at teenagers. I definitely think that that's one that will either be in line with your tastes or not, and you know, fair enough either way. Um, speaking of genre fiction, I also picked up the first volume in the Masked series. This is called Anomalies. This is written by Serge Schleiman and drawn by Stéphane Créti, and it was translated by Edward Gauvin, who has done a lot of great BD translations. He is probably one of my favorite translators if you're gonna read these in translation. This is set in Paris in the dystopic near future. There are robots, there are possible mutant things going on. The main character is an ex-military guy who is dealing with both physical and emotional problems. His girlfriend is in prison. And it's mostly a, a setup for the rest of the series. I found this thoroughly entertaining. The art is fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed this, and I kind of like that Titan has made them slightly smaller than the standard albums because these actually fit on a bookshelf a little more easily. But if I do have one complaint about this, it is that the pacing is a little off. In almost every scene that we get, I felt like this would have been stronger if it had two to four additional panels of almost every scene that we have. The main character with his sister, the flashback sequence at the beginning of the main character with his military unit, Almost everything felt like it could have had just a little bit more background or a little bit more story to it. Still, I did quite enjoy this. Next up, uh, I have another kind of post-apocalyptic piece of science fiction. Uh, this is volume one of Aberato, which is called Riel, which is the name of the main character. This is written and drawn by Thierry Labrosse. And hilariously, the author is from Montreal. This book is set in Montreal, and these books are almost impossible to get in Canada. The first volume, you can get the Kindle version of, but the rest of them 
like if I want to read this, not only does my library not have them, but I basically have to order these from France. And I find that really weird because this is a book by a Canadian author set in Canada. I do love the art. Um, this is the kind of book that you normally do see set in Paris, maybe London or New York or something. And so it was kind of fun to see this a setting like this in Montreal. It is weird being that it's Montreal. I did think the it seemed to be clearly aimed at a European audience rather than a Canadian audience. So I guess maybe that was part of the publishing. Like when people swear, they swear in a very European way and not a Canadian way, uh, which is to say, because if you're not familiar with uh, the, dif the swearing difference, Canadian French swearing tends to be really religious and like European French swearing tends to be a lot of prostitute brothel kind of references. Um, and it's more the latter than the former, which I thought was a little weird. Um, also, one of the characters is a police officer in here who is Mohawk and he wears a feather in his hair, which I thought was ridiculous. But I think it's because for a European audience, when you draw a character, there, there tends to be a kind of, there's the white guy, the brown guys who are Arab and the black guys, and they here he's the brown guy, so they have to indicate that he's indigenous and not Arab in a different way. And I thought that was a little heavy handed, but again, I think that's a matter of the audience. Um, and, but aside from those two things, I did enjoy this and I wish they were easier to get. One piece of very popular nonfiction that a lot of people were reading this month is My Time Among the Whites, Notes from an Unfinished Education uh, by Janine Capo Cruset, which I always want to say Cruset, but I've watched multiple videos and you seem to pronounce the T, so. I found this to be a really quick read. It was compellingly written in terms of style. I read this all in one day, basically in one and a half sittings. And the bits that are dealing with her personal life where she talks about her experience being the first person in her family to have gone to university and having chosen to go to a very expensive university as opposed to a local, less expensive state one. I mean, American universities are all super expensive regardless, but, um, and what that meant career-wise and in terms of class mobility as well, but also culturally and what that meant being among people who were in general wealthier and having a different educational history cross-generational. She also talks about being the first person in her family to be born in the United States. Her parents were Cuban and she talks a bit about the particularness of being Cuban-American because there was that whole embargo so they couldn't travel back as Americans. It's interesting because she talks about being annoyed by Americans who would ask her as someone who identified as Cuban-American, have you ever been to Cuba? And that they didn't appreciate that she wasn't able to do that, which I think is funny uh, in terms of just the broader awareness of that, because I know in Canada and a lot of Western Europe, Cuba has always been a place where a lot of people go on resort or beach vacations. And the running joke is, and there are no Americans. It's great because there are no Americans. <laughs> Not to be insulting to Americans because everybody has the stereotype of one or two nationalities who, you know, travel poorly or whatever. So it's funny because here, that's a place that you hear people go to resorts specifically because they know Americans can't go there. And then in the US, people don't seem to realize that they can't go there or couldn't go there. I think that's changed over the past few years. So I thought that was interesting. And so those bits were quite compelling, but the more she talked about the racial picture, especially in terms of there's one story where she's on a dude ranch in Nebraska and she talks about essentially passing for white where, while I feel like what she was actually passing for is Anglo. And, and it kind of baffled me that the discussion didn't differentiate between the levels of race prejudice versus ethnic prejudice, because to be Latinx, to be Latin American, Latino, Latina, whatever label you're using is a cultural label. It's not a racial label. And because she has the discussion of her parents were white in Cuba, they weren't when they first moved to the US, they were sort of as Miami's demographics shifted, she grew up feeling white and then she wasn't when she left. And there is that discussion, but it seems to never get into the difference between say racism and xenophobia or color prejudice versus ethnic prejudice. Because she's talking so much about the perceptions and about that kind of shifting, it felt like this glaring lack of something there. Because Latin America is one of those places like North Africa and West Asia in which people 
can be natively of the culture in terms of heritage and be white or brown or black or any variation within that. It just seemed weird that it was missing. So even though I liked this and found this really compelling and engaging, I felt like she was having a conversation about three things and there's a fourth one that makes the set and the fourth one was never discussed. There was also a weird thing about Disneyland or Disney World, which probably makes more sense if you're from Florida. I read it and went, I, I just didn't get it. it was, but if you're from Florida or you're a big Disney fan, I think that part might be more for you. I was kind of baffled by that one. It was a lot of, let's read some really heavy social stuff into Disney World. And I just went, I don't get it, but I'm not from Florida. So if you've read that and you connected with the Disney one, I'd love to hear how it connected with you and or how it connected for you, with you. I don't know. It, those are a lot of books that I had some complaints about, but here's a book that I don't have complaints about. This is Tommy Pico's Feed, which is part of his series of poetry memoir releases. This stylistically reminds me a lot of Duck's Newburyport, which everybody's been reading this year. But unlike that thousand page beast, this is 78 pages and it's basically the same kind of feeling, obviously from somebody of a different set of demographic categories. In terms of the style, it's a very similar feeling, but successfully doing that in 78 pages versus doing it in a thousand pages. Normally when I talk about poetry, I fold over some pages and to decide what to read and I have just dozens of them folded over because so much of this is, I don't know, it's just great. I'll read one page to give you a feeling of it. Dear reader, I've been thinking about fuel sources that produce the heat of the fire that burns inside you and the term resistive circuit and active networks and mainly about Kirchhoff's current law, that the sum of all currents entering a node is equal to the sum of all currents leaving the node, by which I mean it's pollen season again and it's got my circuitry inconsolable and the city stopped texting me back, which, WTF, I've never been ghosted on by a whole city. It's very men. TFW, you want the city to know you hate it, but also like it doesn't even occur to you to think about the city. Wait, who are you? Oh yeah, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, I'm having the Baja fish tacos. You should go to Shell. Sorry, I mean have the macaroni. I hear it's, wait a minute, who are you again? I'm talking to the freaking reader. Can you give me a minute? JFC. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about stretched denim that doesn't also have a stretchy waistband by which I mean nature's cruelest disagreements. I've also been thinking about the slobbering of heat that is the promise of spring. In her book, An Everlasting Meal, Tamar Adler, waxing poetic on boiling cauliflower, writes, heat is a vital broker between separate things. In the insanely popular early 90s alternative rock banger, Linger, Dolores O'Riordan sings, if you, if you could return, don't let it burn, don't let it fade. Today, to wear out the woozy, to giddy the skittish dizzy into a simple rush of stillness, I buttered around the city listening to the cranberries as the air around me bounded into its summer self. But literally two weeks ago there was a blizzard that thawed into a song. Anyway, I love this. But I don't think that will be to everybody's taste because not everyone wants stream of consciousness, even if it is 78 pages and not a thousand pages. But I was thoroughly entertained by that. I read a few other things, but some of them I'm discussing elsewhere, I think. So we'll talk about that later. All right, if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought of them. Yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.